yeah! Ooh, god damn, it's Behind the Bastards, the only podcast on the internet. If you have ever listened to another podcast, no, you have not. That's schizophrenia. <laughs> sorry, sorry to tell you this way. That's um, a radio show. <laughs> Eat it. Yeah. Uh, this is a podcast about the worst people in all of history, and to help me talk about a real son of a bitch, I have... Matt Lieb, one of the hey, best people in all of history. That's right. I'm back, mm-hmm. baby. So happy to be here. I am now a dad. Uh, I am yep, just yep. so Your tired. official legal nickname is now Matt Daddy Lieb. Uh, yeah, so if you could just call me Daddy on the internet, I'd appreciate it. Mm-hmm. Um, stoked yeah. to be back, guys. Um, mm-hmm. Just a reminder, I am uh, part of the creator of the world's only The Wire podcast, uh, Pod Yourself The Wire. That's right. So uh, listen to that. Give us five stars in a review, and you'll enjoy it. The fuck did I do? That's my soundboard. Yeah. I won't do that too much, I promise. God damn right. Oh, I forgot we have a soundboard when you're here. <laughs> oh, incredible. Incredible. Yeah, it's all the wire drops, baby. <laughs> It's the wire. Oh, amazing. I, yeah. I was Speaking just of, talking about McNulty and how I'm yeah. outraged that he is Prince Charles in the crown because he is way he's too, too handsome. He's way he's too, too handsome. Hot, but I, I am kind of enjoying watching McNulty in his natural accent. Cause oh, let's it's be weird. Real. I haven't heard him do his actual like. Ever. No, that's what he's. That's what he sounds like. I he's know. a British guy. Yeah, and on the wire, you just like, oh god, he just is like. Sometimes you're like, he's crushing it, and sometimes he is just like way off. Yeah. <laughs> with the Baltimore accent, so it's nice to see him being like, oh, I'm a prince of England, yeah. You know, that's that's what he's supposed to sound like. Yeah. Now you know, speaking of the wire, which yes. is set in Baltimore, mm. Baltimore, compared to where we are. Not very far from the Great Lakes. And you know what Mm. today is? You know what this week is, Matt Lieb? What? It is the 47th anniversary of the sinking of the Edmund Fitzgerald, which took 26 brave men to their deaths at the bottom of the world's primary foe, Lake Superior. Yeah. (laughs) I remember that. I know that because there's a song mm -hmm. about it. Well, the legend lives on from the Chippewa on down, you know? That's right. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Um, and I, I, I think, Matt, I don't know if we, we've talked about this, but do you remember in the, in the, in the mid-1980s when the United States retired our Titan missile arsenal? Um, I don't remember that specifically. Uh, that's well, not my number one thought about the 80s, but sounds the, right. The Titan was the largest ICBM ever used uh, mm. or ever deployed. Um, it had a nine megaton nuclear warhead. It was the most, single most powerful nuclear weapon in U.S. history. And we, mm. we got rid of them because, number one, they were expensive. And number two, a bunch of them wound up in accidents that almost killed millions of people. In a, some bullshit. Anyway, yeah. my, my, my proposal, Matt, we build a shitload more Titans. Mm. And we fire all those sons of bitches off at Lake Superior until, yeah. that's, until it's a goddamn canyon. Until that whole fucking yes. lake is a skate park, yeah. Matt. Yeah, who's superior that's right. now, bitch? That's right, motherfucker. Come yeah. on. You think you're so great? Well, how do you like having no water? That's because right. We boiled assume, it out. Yeah, we boil it out through the Also, bombs. I assume if we use a nuke to boil all of the water out of Lake Superior, mm. the Southwest will get... More rain, probably, right? That seems like it should solve the problems with the Colorado ri- River. We can keep making least, almonds for a like couple it years. Would, it would solve climate change. Yeah. It's worth a shot, right? Why not? That's, that's, why not? That, that's going to be my campaign slogan world- when I run for president. <laughs> just just a why nuke not? detonating above Lake Superior. And a, why not? Why not? What do we got to lose? <laughs> Honestly, if the world's ending anyways, Let- we might as mm-hmm. well try a nuke Lake yeah. Superior you know, okay. model of strategy. Okay, listeners, this has absolutely nothing to do with what we're talking about. It has oh. a little bit to do with what we're talking please about today, ex- Sophie. Please explain, please explain how Lake Superior... Well, go- Sophie, uh, please, Lake please. Superior, by taking the name Superior, oh is putting on God. airs that it's better than the rest of us. And you know who else thinks they're better than the rest he of us? It. Nazis? Hereditary nobility. Oh, yeah, that's true. That's true. Matt, yes. what do you know about Napoleon? Wait, wait, wait. The third. Oh, love, love Napoleon the third. Napoleon the third. I'm a huge Napoleon the third stand. Are you? Are you? I, are you? I am. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm maybe I'm not pro Napoleon the third, but I'm a big fan. I like that he's the actual small Napoleon. 
Uh, I like. He was. He was a lot smaller than than Napoleon Bonaparte, who was slightly above average size for the right. time. Regular uh, OG Napoleon was like a regular guy, like regular yeah. size guy, just with a funny accent. Whereas like Napoleon the Third is the one who was actually small. And mm-hmm. he's also the one who was like, uh, you know, he was what the first president of of uh, of France, and then immediately became the se- the second emperor of France. Like it's he's he's a fascinating he is, guy. He, he is a fascinating did guy. The, he he is, did the the the, the his twist, facial hair his was facial a, was a hair. mess. Oh, yeah, the, was a huge yeah, mess. Yeah. Wonderful was facial hair. One of the most influential dudes who ever lived. Um, yeah. Most people, including like when I started this, I I knew some about him. I did not realize how much of the modern world was built because of this guy's fumbling. Like yeah. he, yes. he created modernity mainly <laughs> through fucking up and not thinking things <laughs> through. It's kind yes. of incredible. Um, yeah. So there's there's two big books that I I got through for this. One of which sucked, and one of which was pretty good. Mm-hmm. Um, um, it's it, the case with nobility. The fun thing about writing about hereditary European nobility Mm -hmm. is that basically every second of their lives is documented, right? Like you're, you're never wondering, I wonder what was happening in their childhood. It's like, no, man, we've got like 40 different letters from like people who worked (laughs) in the house and like, like we know everything about their lives. The downside is that we know everything about their lives. So this Mm. is going to be a four parter. (laughs) (laughs) Hell yeah. Oh, that's Um, exciting. Exciting times here. So before we get into Napoleon, Hold on, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, the I'm gonna just uh, give a bunch of Benadryl to my baby so it sleeps for twelve oh, hours. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what? Let's <laughs> let's both take some Benadryl. Let's all do it. Let's all take some Benadryl and hear noises that aren't there. As an aside, we were hanging out recently with Dr. Kava Hoda of the House of Pod, a friend of Hell the show, yeah. and. Um, I showed he it was him and another doctor friend of his who was in from out of state and we were all mm. drinking together and I realized they hadn't heard about the Benadryl subreddit where teenagers take insane oh, doses of gosh. Benadryl in order to hallucinate and I put it they were distraught. Kavi yeah. was trying to log in <laughs> through my friend's tw- uh, my friend's Reddit account to post yeah. to warn people to stop doing what they were. I was like no 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 Kava they already took the 600 milligrams of Benadryl they, they, yeah. they've done what they're doing. I'm so yeah. sorry. That was it's mean. too late. Yeah, well, this, you can't stop this. I didn't know that there was a subreddit about it. A uh, subreddit mm-hmm. about it. I actually that was uh, when I was really really into drugs. At one point, I was just like looking up what kind of adverse effects can happen if you take too much of whatever drug. And there's stuff you want to avoid, obviously, like any, you know, non uh, steroidal anti inflammatories will yes. really fuck you up. But, you want to invo- you want to avoid most of the drugs that are medicine for something else unless yes. you take a pile of them. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. yeah, 100%. 100%. But I did read uh you know back in those days that uh yeah, if you take a bunch of Benadryl, you'll have oh, auditory yes. hall- hallucinations and I you took will, a bunch yeah. and Horrible. I played a whole symphony in my head. It was incredible. Oh wow, you had a good time. Okay, well, well, you know. no. Then my back, though, my spine felt like it was vibrating out of my yeah. body. It yeah. was very painful. It wasn't fun, and I think I almost died. But music, mm-hmm. music but music, yeah. So yeah. you know, speaking of music, mm. there's an overture about Napoleon, right? Like the 1812 overture. So oh, anyway, let's yeah. talk about Napoleon Bonaparte. Less. Uh One day we'll do episodes on Napoleon. Obviously, he's a fascinating bastard. But oh yeah, uh, we just need to go into a little bit of history, kind of about the later period of his reign, because mm-hmm. that's where the life of Napoleon the Third starts. Absolutely. So in 1808, Napoleon Bonaparte was the master of Europe. He had been born in Corsica, which was on the periphery of French power to a fairly minor noble family. He was actually more Italian than French, like right. in the way that we would talk about it now. But Italy was not its own thing, right? It was kind yeah. of being consistently fought over by the Austrians and the French and yada, yada. Mm-hmm. In 1789, when we have our, ourselves a French revolution, Napoleon mm-hmm. Bonaparte was a fervent supporter of the revolution. He was a Republican yeah. for a while. Yeah. And I mean that in like the literal, he supported a republic. A sense, republic, obviously. yes. Yeah. yeah. He was a Jacobin. Or at least yeah, he, was he, a, he, 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 they're about, yeah, 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 yeah. And obviously, like, you could say, like, oh, he was, you know, lying the whole time waiting to get power. But I don't know. I think people 
change their opinion on stuff over time. And when I don't know, whatever, I don't I don't know. I'm not an expert on Napoleon Bonaparte. Yeah. Um, so he he did lament the execution of the king and queen of France. Uh, yeah. But he broadly speaking, thought that the republic was a good idea. And mm-hmm. he served it exceptionally well in it uh, as a, a, an officer in the military, despite the fact that he was at one point briefly imprisoned during the reign of terror. Yeah. Uh, eventually, the post-revolutionary government, spoiler, proved kind of dysfunctional, uh, mm-hmm. partly due to the fact that they kept murdering each other <laughs> and yeah. a bunch of other people. Um, yeah, and different, so, different yeah. factions kept getting in power and beheading the other factions. Yeah. And, and, you, know. you know, there's a shitload of wars, which is how Napoleon Bonaparte winds up fighting in Egypt, which you might recognize as pretty fucking far from France. <laughs> <laughs> they had to get um, it before the british got it i yeah. understand the entire you know like why they did it because they're like no nah, dude if we don't do this fucking britain's gonna do it yeah but, but it was a terrible idea and, and he, his experience in egypt is it's a little bit kind of like erwin rommel's gonna be a couple of hundred years later where right. he doesn't win but everyone's very impressed with how well he does and he yeah. kind of nearly pulls it off so he's a, he's a war hero when he comes back to france overthrows the government and establishes himself as first consul. We're skimming over a lot of stuff here, but yeah. Yeah. So this and a number of other things pisses off the other powers of Europe who were already not thrilled about the French Revolution. And one by one, they start coming after him. And Napoleon beats them all. Um, He is... It is, uh, you know, talking when you talk about like what make ranking like the quality of military commanders, you kind of have to do everyone before about World War One and then everyone after because the nature of war changes so right. so drastically. But Napoleon up the first like several thousand years of human war. Uh, being a good general pretty much always means the same thing, which is right. You have this set piece military and you mm-hmm. are able to like you are able to command it in a war of maneuver until bringing the other enemy to battle and defeating them, right? That, like, that's right. What, what makes you a good military commander. And it is it is arguable that Napoleon was the best at that that any human being has ever been. Um, yeah. He has a military record in terms of numbers of victories, in terms of number of times he was outnumbered, that uh, eclipses Alexander the Great and basically everybody else. He is yeah. he is unstoppable right up until the end when he is stopped. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, to put it in modern warfare terms, like his uh, death to kill ratio was like amazing. And he could do yeah. like 360 no scopes all yes, day long. That's right. He is no he no scopes the shit out of everyone in Europe for a, for a while. <laughs> for a um, while. Obviously, he's going to overreach here in a little bit, but that hasn't happened in mm. 1808. Um things are doing great there. Uh his armies dominate most of Europe. He's declared emperor in 1804, and as soon as that happens, the Bonapartes, who again had been kind of a minor noble family, are suddenly like one of the great families of Europe. They're yeah. equal to the Habsburgs in the House of fucking Windsor, right? Cuz yeah. all of fucking Europe is their domain. Now, Napoleon, being the head of the family, because he has effectively conquered Western Europe, Mm -hmm. starts to turn the Bonapartes into the regents of territories he's conquered, right? Like, they're my my brothers and cousins and shit. Like, I can trust them the best, so I'm going to make them kings of... These areas I've captured. All right, uh, Lucien. So, uh, so uh, this whole thing, we're just going to call it like the uh, North Italy. Yeah, yeah, you just rule all that shit, <laughs> okay? Is- One of y'all bitches take Spain and it- uh, fucking whatever, dude. This Lucien- is it. Because it's so modern, like people look at this and are like, wow, this is really like gangster shit. But that's the only way that mo- feudalism has ever worked. No, by the yeah, way. it's yeah, all just gangster shit. shit. Gangster yeah. shit is based off of feudalism. That's that. Yes. That's, that was the <laughs> yes. original gangster shit. So Joseph is the becomes the king of Naples uh, and yeah, also Joseph. the king of Spain. Um, mm-hmm. Jerome is made the king of Westphalia, who, and I never remember where Westphalia is, but it's somewhere, somewhere west. In, in somewhere west, west sure. West of Westphalia, you would assume. Yeah, yeah, you'd assume. Um, his sisters Elisa and Pauline become princesses. His sister Carolyn is made a queen of somewhere. Mm-hmm. Lucian actually, you bring up Lucian, refuses his brother. Yes. Um, he will not bow to uh, his, his like his kin. But Louis Napoleon, um, who is also almost as strong-headed as Lucian, does reluctantly agree to serve as king of Denmark. Right. Now, it will not surprise you to learn that Napoleon Bonaparte rules his family with the same kind of iron fist as he rules every... He is literally Napoleon. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. So he commands them to marry who he wants them to marry. He orders them to get divorced just as easily. He 
names their children for them. No, no, no Bonaparte who accepts a royal gift is allowed to travel without his permission. He keeps them on a tight leash. But as long as their brother remains emperor, they've also got all of the wealth and influence that, you know, they could have only dreamed of before. So it's kind of a mixed bag. Um, as some people know, the great love of Napoleon's life is the Empress Josephine. Uh, mm. She had two children already when they got married. And Napoleon is going to have a bunch of children with his mistresses. But for unknown reasons, she and Napoleon are unable to conceive children together. Right? Yeah. They both do have kids with other people, but they just can't together. There's theories about why. that. I think she was too old she has, or something. I, I I, yeah, I think the leading theory is that after she has her first two kids, something happens and she's infertile. Yeah. Um, but obviously, we're not going to know exactly why, because this is 1806 or whatever. Um, I say yeah. zoom the body and check on those. Yeah, ovaries, get in there. Get, get in, in there. there. <laughs> Open it up. See what's going on. Maybe there's a little, you know, egg topic Napoleon baby yeah. in there. Do the do the do the the Jurassic Park thing. Suck out a little bit of Napoleon Josephine <laughs> DNA and <laughs> boom. Napoleon finally make that DNA. baby. <laughs> Put him in a raptor cage, have fucking Muldoon with a shotgun sitting outside, feed him goats. I don't know what we're doing here. They remember. Yeah. <laughs> they should all be destroyed. <laughs> um, that It would be funny to be like a Nick U doctor and, and do that. Like, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. All dressed up as Muldoon. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Putting bottles in their mouths, mm -hmm. <laughs> spaz 12 by your side. Anyway, mm. um, so yeah, uh, they are unable to have a kid together, which is a problem because Napoleon is the emperor of France and, you know, having an heir is kind of important. Yeah, it's like um, the whole thing. So he's got some kids with his side chick, Eleanor, but, you know, they're not legal kids. So eventually Napoleon is going to divorce Josephine, although he remains in love with her for the rest of his life. It's a complicated yeah. story. But yeah. he divorces her to marry a teenage girl named Mary Louise. Mm -hmm. uh, she is 18, uh, which is, I, I gotta say, from by the standards yes. of European royalty in the yes. 1800s, he 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 likes them old. <laughs> yeah, 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 that's true. That's true. Like that is basically like what ten years from death at this point. Yeah, so yeah, yeah, that yeah is you are that is that made that was legally fifty five years old back then. <laughs> <laughs> so. Um, he marries Marie Louise, uh, who is the daughter of the Emperor of Austria, uh, to try to get himself a baby that can be his heir. But in the meantime, you know, anything could happen. Uh, you've got to, he's constantly going to war and shit. So you've got to take actions to ensure that the burgeoning House of Bonaparte has an actual line of secession. Mm -hmm. For reasons that make sense to royalists, Napoleon Bonaparte decides the best thing he can do is marry Josephine's daughter, Hortense, off to his younger brother, Louis, to connect the families by blood. Their children would be Bonapartes and thus eligible to inherit the empire. <clears throat> now, and again, that actually shows kind of, even though he does divorce her in this way that's kind of fucked up, that he loves Josephine because he's like, well, I'm going to make sure my heir is a mix of her blood and my blood, even though we can't right. conceive a child together, which is fascinating. I actually can't really think of another case of something like that. It's a very interesting story. No, he's um, a simp. I mean, yeah. like, he's the biggest Jos Josephine simp of all time, you know? Like, he's a, he was a simp, and we have all of his letters to prove it, and listen, I I am also a simp, so I just want to say uh, simp pride, and I don't think we should use it as a slur. Mm -hmm. How about that? Mm -hmm. Hey, you know what, Matt? We could call him the simperer Napoleon. Oh! Oh, there we go. All right. We got puns. All right. So, uh, as with most royal marriages, no consideration was given as to whether or not uh, Louis and Hortense actually wanted to be in a relationship. That was not at all important to Napoleon Bonaparte. Um, I'm going to quote now from Louis Napoleon and the Second Empire, a book by J.M. Thompson. And this is the biography that I did not like as much. Quote, she was not in love with Louis, and he did not want to marry, but they could not withstand the emperor's will and were made man and wife by the papal legate, Cardinal Caprara, on January 4th, 1802. On October 10th, the same year, their first son was born, named Napoleon Charles. On October 11th, 1804, a second son, named Napoleon Louis. By this time, everyone knew that the marriage was a failure. Louis neg neglected his wife. Dis uh, disliked her girlish tastes, suspected her friendships, and spied on her at every turn. She pined for Paris and Malmaison, and resented his puritanical discipline. So, 
it's not a love marriage. It's not going great. She wants to have a, a life, and he is angry whenever she does anything but, like, sit like a nun in her house. Also, as a heads up, right, yeah. his first two kids are Napoleon Charles and uh, Napoleon Lewis. He is Lewis Napoleon. Hey, everybody. Robert here. Uh, sorry, I make a number of mistakes about royalty early on. I am trying to correct them now. He's not Louis Napoleon. He is Louis Bonaparte. Now, keep that in mind because I'm about to call him Louis Napoleon a bunch of times. It is very frustrating, but no, he, the brother of Napoleon Bonaparte is Louis Bonaparte. His sons are Louis Napoleon and Napoleon Louis, but they are also Bonapartes. I'm sorry. This is very frustrating. Uh, I made some mistakes here. Um, their uncle is Napoleon Bonaparte. The names are going to be frustrating in the yeah, first episode yeah, yeah. or so of this. Yeah, yeah it's going to be difficult to, to tell them all apart. <laughs> yeah. So Louis Napoleon, again, the dad, Napoleon Bonaparte's brother, is also one of Napoleon's best generals, right? Like, this is not a case where he just, like, makes his brother a general and he's like, like Napoleon's, Louis Napoleon is a very capable field commander. And he runs his house like a a household of soldiers. Nothing Hortense did was ever good enough for him. It was a sad marriage, and her only comfort was her confusingly named sons, Napoleon Charles and Napoleon Louis. Like all tales of European nobility, this, again, has about 100 people with the same name, and we'll, we'll do the best here. So, <laughs> Napoleon Bonaparte is an interesting guy. He's, he's a monster, and, I mean, he kills millions of people or gets them killed. But he also is, like, a weirdly understanding dude in some ways, and he saw the way that his brother Louis was acting in the marriage, and from a castle in Poland, where he was with the time living with his mistress, he sends his brother a letter. Quote, your quarrels with the queen are becoming pri public property. If only you would keep for family life the fatherly and effeminate disposition you exhibit in the sphere of, sphere of government and apply to public affairs the severity that you display at home. You Damn. drill your young wife like a regiment of soldiers. You have the best and worthiest wife in the world, and yet you are making her unhappy. Let her dance as much as she likes. She is just the age for it. Do you expect a wife of 20 who sees her life slipping away and dreams of all she is missing to live in a nunnery or a nursery with nothing to do but but bathe her baby make Hortense happy she is the mother of your children the only way to treat her with all the only way to treat her is with all possible trust and respect it's a pity she is so virtuous if you were married to a flirt she would lead you by the nose but she is proud to be your wife and is pained and repelled by the mere idea that you may be thinking poorly of her <laughs> that's like pretty it's, he's, good actually he's 100 percent right and it's yeah. also coming from a place of like do you know how lucky you are to have a lady yeah. who's not cheating on you all the time yeah okay and all she's like, josephine like, did was cheat on me and i love her still <laughs> you know how lucky you are yeah i do i do it does kind of make me like him more to hear yeah. him be like dude let her dance she's a kid what do yeah, you what do you want chill out stop being is, a dick it is funny that louis napoleon is, was uh was basically like uh you know all she wants to do all day is dance and other girl stuff and it's mm -hmm. like can we ride a fucking horse please <laughs> please it's interesting too the napoleons are fat the bonapartes are fascinating because louis napoleon is a dick at this point he's going to evolve into like the only correct person in the entire story yeah. this louis napoleon not his yeah. son, also Louis Napoleon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> anyway, the other. Well, this is Louis Bonaparte. Sorry, not Louis Bonaparte. His son is Louis Napoleon. Oh, God, I hate, so I hate confusing. the fucking names. Yeah, yeah. Um. So shortly after sending this letter. Uh, Louis Napoleon's son, young Napoleon Louis, uh, or sorry, Louis Bonaparte's son, young Napoleon Louis. I'm having a stroke, dude. <laughs> I, I, it's horrible. He gets he gets one of the infinite number of sicknesses that little kids get back then, and he's he's soon dead as hell. Um, very oh, sad. Yeah. yeah uh, this tragedy shocks Louis Bonaparte into acting less like a piece of shit for a little while. Like yeah. he tries to be chill with his wife because their kid just died. Um, he's doing his best. He's not like a, a goblin. For his part, Napoleon Bonaparte is concerned about the fact that he's down an heir, right? Mm -hmm. But to his credit, he doesn't focus primarily on that. He focuses his attention on Hortense. Again, he really loves her like a daughter. Um, and he writes to her that he's worried because, quote, you have lost interest in life and are indifferent to everything. So... Which is also an understanding way to feel uh, yeah. in that situation. But it's also interesting that he recognizes that. Uh, this makes Charles Napoleon the heir to the empire, which is quite a lot of pressure. That pressure gets eased a little bit on April 20th, 1808, when Louis Bonaparte and Hortense 
uh, have their third son, who they named Louis Napoleon Bonaparte. So we just lost Napoleon Louis. Yeah. Now we've got Louis this Napoleon, so who's the focus of the episode, <laughs> son of Louis Bonaparte. Mm. So Louis Bonaparte is the king of Holland, brother of Napoleon Bonaparte. His sons, Charles N- Napoleon and Louis Napoleon, God, Robert, are, are now the kids that are alive. This, this is horrible. I hate this too. And you it's would very think, you frustrating. Would think they would have learned from this by now, but I was just yeah. re- but I was just reading that t- uh, 10% of the U.S. Senate is now made up of John's. Mm. Ugh, unbelievable. unbelievable. Yeah. Should be illegal. Should be a crime. Like, did we it, not it, learn from Napoleon? Get a new name. You, what you, know what else should, you know what else should be a crime, fellas? <laughs> Allowing the Great Lakes to exist unmolested. Absolutely. That's, that's, the, that's the real sedition. Fuck this January 6th shit. Yeah. We yeah. need to investigate sympathizers with the great lakes yeah yeah speaking of, the, speaking of the great lakes have you heard the 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 viral song about uh, michigan's governor gretchen whitmer called Mm-mm. big gretch because it's a vibe is it like a pro gretch song or yeah an anti- oh like, all right <laughs> like fuck with us we got big gretch it's really yeah it, it made me as as a as a person with relatives from michigan it made me laugh it's only Michigan. <laughs> yeah, only Michigan. Can we, keep, think... can we keep the Great Lakes in Michigan and just get rid of the ones that aren't in Michigan? No. Which is 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 Lake Michigan the one that's in Michigan? So wait, I, you know, do you guys remember when we did debathification in Iraq? That's what we need to do with the Great Lakes. Yeah, well, what about we need to Big de- Gretch. Debath mm-hmm. it. N- mm-hmm. Make it not a giant bath no more. I don't know what I'm saying. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I'm losing my mind. I haven't slept in eight days. Um, At- yeah, taste. we should do that with the uh, Lake Superior and all the lakes, dude. Destroy them. Fuck them. Fuck the, the Great Lakes are the real cabal, you know? I agree. I agree 100%. 100%. Anyway. Yeah, you, do you hear that, Kanye? It's not the people who you think are true. Yeah, yeah. I don't, yeah. let's I don't go DEFCON 3. Let's go DEFCON 3 on the Great Lakes. <laughs> DEFCON 3. Mm-hmm. Napoleon's gonna be like fucking Cyrus the Great, or is fucking uh, <laughs> Kanye is gonna be like Cyrus the Great, ordering him in to whip the lake. Yes, yes, That's the shit we need, baby. I love a All good right. uh, Cyrus the Great reference. On oh here. man, he was pretty good. He was pretty good. Here's some ads. We're back. I've just been ogling pictures of Cyrus the Great. Incredible calves. Oh yeah. Um, I have a time machine. I only use it to get photos of the calves of historical hotties. Um, (laughs) Just could have stopped 9-11. Chose not to. Mm. Just let that one happen. Yeah. I went back to 9-10 just to be like, I ain't stopping this. Yeah. I didn't. I ain't. Nothing. Yeah. Anyway, let's talk about all of the different people named Louis Napoleon. (laughs) So annoying. His father who is Louis Bonaparte, not Louis Napoleon, but who mm. I will probably mistakenly call Louis Napoleon in another couple of times in this story. Oh, 100%. Yeah. Periodically is going to be a dick, but pretty much after this point, he gets increasingly chill. Um, so, you know, people grow over time. Uh, the marriage, though, between Louis Bonaparte and Hortense is unhappy enough that Louis asks his brother, Napoleon Bonaparte, for permission to have a divorce soon after the birth of Louis Napoleon, the focus of our episode. Mm-hmm. Uh, but since Napoleon had just divorced Josephine so he could marry a teenager to have babies, felt that imperial prestige had taken enough of a hit from the yeah. divorce already. Uh, and so he told his brother no. So the earliest years of Louis Napoleon's life included frequent fights between his mother and father and long periods of separation where he generally spent time with his mom. He does not really have a relationship with his dad for most of the first, like, 14 years of his life. Um, That's why he's so tiny. It stunted his growth. It stunted his growth. That's right. That's Mm -hmm. right. Dads dads are how you get tall. Um, Now, it is unlikely that he had much memory of the period in which his father was king of Holland because in 1810, when he's two... Louis Bonaparte has a series of fights with his brother. And it all came down to Napoleon Bonaparte's controlling nature. He wanted his brothers to act as regents only if he'd do what they said, acting as his proxies. And Louis Bonaparte is a guy with some integrity. He's like, well, if I'm the king, then I should be like making my own decisions. And right. when he realizes that that's not okay, he's like, well, fuck it. I abdicate. I don't want right. to be Yeah. Anymore. What's the point yeah. of me being a king if my yeah. stupid brother is just going to tell me how to do king yeah. shit? Yeah. 
So he quits. Uh, he flees to Bohemia, leaving his wife in charge of the kid. And now that his brother isn't king anymore, Napoleon doesn't care if they stay together. Uh, and he gives Hortense a pile of money to live peacefully in Paris with her sons, his who are still his heirs, right? right. Their kids are still his heirs to the throne. Yeah. Um, now, as is sometimes the case, things between Louis Bonaparte and Hortense get better after they split up. Um, they just are not people who should have ever been married. Um, uh, and the two remain married but separated the rest of Hortense's life. This is probably best for everyone involved, but it means that as little Louis grows up, his father is this distant, seldom seen, seen figure. Um, he deeply admires his dad because his dad's a war hero and a former king, but he doesn't know him well. Um, and as Hortense had found, it was very difficult for him to be good enough for Louis Bonaparte. One biography writes that during this time, he, quote, knew of his father only as an enemy. Some sources have claimed that Emperor Napoleon himself kind of sailed into the gap to act as the main male role model for Louis during this period. This is sort of true, but not in a way that means he was, like, there regularly. It still right. probably means the young Louis, Louis has, like, five memories of ever meeting the guy. Yeah, Biographer yeah. J.M. Thompson writes, quote, Louis Napoleon would be too young to remember more, perhaps, than the impression of a sleek, tubby, talkative little man who took him on his knee, lifting him alarmingly by his head, a man with a menacing eye and a habit of shouting behind cl closed doors at ministers or ambassadors. It was the rule that Hortense and her children should dine once a week at the Tuileries, where the emperor would make them sit at the table and tell them stories from La Fontaine between conversations with the actors, architects, or officials who might have business to do with him. Now... La Fontaine, and that's who Napoleon Bonaparte, these kids who are his heirs, he's reading them stories from this French author who writes fables, right? La Fontaine is a French author who wrote fables in the late 1600s. And I, I wanted to know, like, well, what kind of bedtime stories did Napoleon Bonaparte think were, like, valuable to give his heirs? Because you right. have to assume he was a, a pretty intentional guy, like he picked them for a reason. Right. I found a, a write-up by Russell Gannon that explains why Napoleon likely thought these stories in particular were good to raise his young heirs with. Quote, for the most part, the discourse on authority communicated in the illustrated fables portrays a kind of enlightened despotism that advocates centralized authority, but one that protects those who do not wield influence and affirms their right to respect grievance or express grievances. Which is kind of the way the the Napoleon runs things. Like right. you're not it's not totalitarian. You're allowed to like make fun of him and stuff. It's right. just like he kind of liberal because was, he knows it, was, it doesn't matter. He yeah. was an enlightened despot. That's exactly yes. right. Yeah. yeah. He's like, listen, I have all the power, I have the best army in the world. You guys can talk a little bit of shit. That's Yeah, okay. you can talk some shit. Yeah. No, no <laughs> yeah. that's fine. Um as master of Europe, Napoleon is, like, traveling a lot. Uh, he spends less than 150 days in Paris during the time that he was emperor and Louis is a human being. So, again, mm -hmm. not around a lot. Uh, by the time Louis was four, Napoleon had gone off to fight in Russia, which Oops. <laughs> goes as well goes as well as fighting for Russia usually goes for everyone, including Russia. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. It is, doesn't end well. Yeah. Um, he loses his empire. Uh, this leads to a brief period where the Bonaparte family are still in position across Europe, but the Allies have, like, forced Napoleon into exile. Uh, they send troops into Paris. And oddly enough, this is not a bad memory for young Louis Napoleon. Mm. Um, so Alexander, the it's the second or the third. He's the Alexander who's going to become czar. He's 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 uh, Nikki's dad, mm. right? Uh, so, hey, Robert here. I fucked up again. So, again, royalty, very frustrating. Alexander I was already czar when he entered Paris in 1814. Um, he is going to be, he's the brother of Tsar Nicholas I, who is the father of, of Tsar Alexander II, who is the father of Nicholas II, who is the Nicky that we covered in our four-parter. He's the one with Rasputin and the getting murdered and all that stuff. Again, royalty, very frustrating, uh, very complicated. Too many names that are the same. And he's not the Tsar yet. He's the Tsarevich, right? He's, yeah. But he, he winds up with his army in the French capital in 1814. Um, and he actually becomes really close with Hortense and Louis Napoleon and his brother, Napoleon Charles or whatever. Despite having watched, like, again, Alexander helps wage one of the most devastating wars in history against uh, her father-in-law. But despite all this, he's extremely kind to Hortense and becomes a close friend, often showing up to check in on her. He just kind of recognizes... Well, her, you know, her, 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 her dad and her, 
or sorry, her mom and her her her, her father in law basically have been like forced out. This is scary. You know, mm. I'm gonna I'll check in on her. She's a young mom. And yes, six. Sh- I just want to make sure uh, you are doing okay. I've been. Uh killing all your people yeah this this is the guy who will have a who will who will force a train conductor to crash a train drunkenly and then blame it on the jews so not (laughs) shouldn't be mistaken about how quality a man this is so he's like he's he's becomes close to the family six-year-old louis napoleon is so grateful to the future czar for comforting his mother that during one visit quote the little fellow sidled up to him and quietly placed one of the czar's upon one of the czar's fingers a ring in which his uh, his uncle prince eugene the viceroy of italy had given him the boy on being asked by his mother what he meant by this said i have only this ring which my uncle gave me but i have given it to the emperor alexander because he has been so kind to you dear mama um and Tsar Alexander keeps the ring for the rest of his life. Uh, so that's cool. That's now, really sweet. That's a that sweet is sweet. story. Yeah, he's a sweet kid. Like Again, he's like six at this point. He hasn't done anything wrong. Um, yeah. This is just like a guy who's nice to his mom in a difficult time. Now, if you know the Napoleon story, you know he's back from exile pretty quick. He just kind of yeah. sails to France. They send the army mm-hmm. to stop him. He's like, hey, army, you remember that like... We used to be cool. What if we did it again? Yeah. And they're like, absolutely, Napoleon. Let's fucking yeah. do it. My favorite um, part about it is that like the the Bourbons were back for like six months. Yeah, they have like a couple of months. <laughs> yeah, and then people were just like, oh, this fucking sucks. And Napoleon just walks over like, can I be emperor again? And all the yeah. armies are like, yep, let's yeah, do yep. it. <laughs> he is... Hard to overstate how popular Napoleon Bonaparte very, is. Very popular. Very um, popular. Yeah. So for a little bit, the Bonapartes are the first family in Paris again. This does not last very long. Yeah. Um, the last time Louis Napoleon will ever see his uncle is the night before Napoleon departs to march with his army for Waterloo. Mm-hmm. As he says goodbye to his heir, Louis Napoleon tells him, uh, tells Napoleon Bonaparte, quote, Sire, I don't want you to go to the war. Those wicked allies will kill you. The emperor was standing next to his number one military commander, Marshal Soult. Uh, Soult? I don't know how to pronounce that fucking name. <laughs> Napoleon could not bring himself to hug his heir because, you know, it's 1812. Yeah. So he tells Soult, embrace the child, Marshal. He has a good heart. Perhaps one day he will be the hope of my race. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> I could not hug the child, but I, cannot, <laughs> I will please. have my my chief Servants, military commander. Shake my child's hand. Yeah. <laughs> He's just weeping. Shake his hand. Shake his hand. Don't wipe his tears. <laughs> That's too kind. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So after this, Napoleon marches off to Waterloo. Doesn't go well for him. He gets exiled for the final time. Somewhere in that period, Bill and Ted take him into the 1980s, but Uh I forget exactly when. Um, His family never sees him again, though. Uh, After this point, the Bonapartes are pariahs in Europe, right? They lose their kingdoms. They are for it is illegal to exist in France as a Bonaparte after this period. They are banned from the country. Yeah. yeah. Um, Some of that is because the 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 Bourbon family takes over and they're like, we can't let these people ever exist in France again. And another part of it is that like. The, the, all of Europe is frightened of Napoleon in a way that, like, there's really not a guy like that. It's like if, yeah, I, I, I don't know. I don't like. I don't know that there's ever been like Hitler's the closest, but it's mm-hmm. kind of we, like we hate Hitler because he was just like this monstrous engine of evil. Napoleon is like just feared because of how qu- he like he was just very competent, right? Yeah, like, and he, he people was- were yeah. He was doing all of the things that like really uh, like were a threat to, I think, royal royalism in general. Like not only was he like had the best army in the world, was super, super popular. You know, because like royals don't need to be popular. They just need to be more powerful. He is. He's popular and he's liberalizing. So he's doing everything wrong. It's like he represents he probably the biggest threat to royalism uh, in Europe uh, uh, ever at this if time. You, if you read the way they talked about him, like mm-hmm. the, the, the crown, other crown heads of Europe, they talk about him like an alien or a plague, like a yeah. monster, like, like, like something supernatural. That's, yeah. the, that's the way. So anyway, they are 
on the run, basically. Like, his family is on the run in Europe for a while because nobody will fucking take them. Yeah. Um, Louis the Eighteenth is installed as King of France. Uh, I'm going to veer between using Louis and Louis uh, a number of times, as I'm going to mispronounce most of the French things in this episode. You can you can deal with it. Look, if you want someone who can pronounce things and is competent, listen to Mike Duncan. You know? <laughs> exactly. I love Mike Duncan. <laughs> I love Mike Duncan, but wait, he can't pronounce <laughs> things. He tries real hard, though. He's and, better and, than me. Oh yeah, hundred percent. He's better than most. <laughs> I like that he tries. Um, yeah, he tries. We are not going to try all that. Much. No. Uh, so that's what this podcast is about. Not you're trying. goddamn. You're goddamn right. It is, mm-hmm. Matt Lieb. So uh, he agrees to preserve. He had agreed when he had taken power the first time before Napoleon came back to preserve all of the liberties granted by the revolutionary constitution. Um, he doesn't do this when he comes back the second time. Yeah. Uh, he cracks down a lot more that <laughs> yeah. time. But At there's, that point, they're like, we're doing the white terror. How yeah. about that? He also, he doesn't get to make it an absolute monarchy again because like the Republicans are still very powerful in France mm-hmm. and are like, all right, well, if you push too far, we did murder all of you once. Like, this could mm-hmm. happen again. Let's not be too fucking cocky, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. Um, you know we'll do it. So under Louis the Eighteenth, France returns to being kind of a, a mid-level power in Europe, right? They are certainly nowhere near the heights they had experienced under Napoleon, which they don't love. Mm-hmm. Uh, he intervenes uh, after a few years in a Spanish civil war, uh, taking Madrid from rebels who had deposed the king. But he removes his troops once the fighting is done, which kind of proves to the British that France is no longer like trying to take over Europe. Mm-hmm. Uh, Louis the Eighteenth dies in September 1824 when Louis Napoleon is 16 years old. Mm. Um, now, his father had finally become a more regular force in his life two years earlier. Um, again, Louis Bonaparte, his chunk of the family had spent the intervening years after Napoleon's defeat living kind of as nomads, sometimes hounded by the authorities. Um, it was not until 1817 that Hortense received permission to settle in Bavaria with her son. Soon after, she was allowed to settle in Switzerland, too, where she moved onto a fancy estate and her oldest son goes off to live with it. So Napoleon Charles goes off to live with Louis Bonaparte, but Prince Louis Napoleon, who is still technically Napoleon. Napoleon Bonaparte's heir, uh, or second heir after his older brother, lives in Switzerland with his mom, right? Mm. That's where he grows up. And he's, yeah, uh, I'm going to quote now from the book The Shadow Emperor by Alan Strauss Schoem, which is the book about Napoleon III that I enjoyed. Quote, the past couple of years of continuous personal upheaval and uncertainty had taken a permanent toll on both Hortense and her son, Louis Napoleon. Always at the back of her mind was the anxiety that soldiers would once again appear on her doorstep with signed orders from the British Foreign Office and the other four members of the Allied Coalition to expel her and her young family from yet another country. That young Prince Louis Napoleon had become as cautious and wary as his mother as his mother of people and of the preferred friendship of newcomers was hardly surprising. For the first time in his life, the young nine-year-old Prince Louis Napoleon had a permanent roof over his head in 1817, his first home in Augsburg, where he soon attended regular classes at the gymnasium or high school with other members of the aristocracy uh, of the aristocracy and haute bourgeoisie. He was cautiously happy. Gradually, the anxiety of the volcanic events of the last three years following the fall of Napoleon now eased his new daily route. His classes were in German, of course, and he quickly became fluent in that language, gradually coming to the point where he spoke French at home with a German accent, which remained with him for the rest of his life. And sorry, his older brother is 16. He's nine when they get a permanent home. Mm -hmm. So... It's worth noting that even at the worst points in their flight, the Bonapartes were never anything but very wealthy and comfortable. The other crowned heads of Europe may have hated and feared Napoleon, but they hated the idea that high royalty could ever become poor or destitute even more, right? Mm, It's kind of more frightening for them to think that someone could fall that far. Right, yeah. So as a result, the Bonapartes keep their fortunes and continue. When I say they're like living as nomads, they're like traveling between mansions and estates and castles, right? right? Often living at someone else's castle for a while but still a castle yeah um yeah <laughs> yeah none of them are ever living in shacks and wearing no like a no fucking burlap sack for clothes no. like yeah they're doing rich people shit but they're like yeah you know they don't have the deed to the property maybe yeah it, it, it's like when a billionaire goes to prison and his prison is nicer than like anyone you know. Any of my <laughs> any of my LAUSD schools that I went to for twelve yeah. years. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's, You're that's, just like, that's the why way it's is like. this nice? You guys have yeah. faster internet than my high school. So 
As a result of all this, Louis Napoleon grows up fearing not the allied nations who had broken his uncle, but his own father, right? And it's not the fear, he's not afraid that his dad's gonna hit him. His dad, as far as I know, is never physically abusive. And I don't even think he's mentally abusive, really. He's instead just intensely, constantly critical of everything his son tries to do. And normally I'd say that's not good, but his son is a giant shithead. Louis oh. Napoleon is a sh- is a huge shithead. So yeah. Louis Bonaparte is right to be constantly critical of him. Yeah. Biographer yeah. Alan Strassholm writes, quote, No one can begin to understand Napoleon the th- Third without fully comprehending the significance of that negative father-son relationship, leaving a much battered ego and sense of self-esteem, helplessly suppressed and humiliated by a twisted, unstable father. I give you my heartfelt blessings, his father wrote following his son's first communion in April 9th, 1821. I pray that God gives you a pure and grateful heart towards him, he who is author of all that is good, and he sheds his light on you, even that you may fulfill your duties to your country and your parents, and that you may understand the differences between right and wrong. This was probably the most benevolent letter his father ever wrote. It was to prove as rare as snows of the Sahara. Mm. So... (laughs) A particularly fascinating example of the relationship between these two guys comes in January of 1829, when at age 21, Louis Napoleon, who, you know, he's 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 done a mandatory period of service in the Swiss military at this point. He's going to become an officer there eventually. He decides he might want to take up a military career as a more permanent thing. Now, this is obviously the Bonaparte family business. His father's a very good general. His uncle's the best of all time. And you might think Louis Bonaparte would have approved of his son joining the military. But Lewis has just fought through the worst war, maybe in human history up to that point. Mm -hmm. Um, And he's kind of been like traumatized by it. He's yeah, affected he's sour by on it. War at this point. Yeah, but yeah. So his son, Louis Napoleon, wants to join the Russian army. And this is open to him because the Tsar, you know, is close with his mom, right? This is a thing that he can work out. Yeah, um, he's got the ring. He's like, yeah, he's, yeah, he's give got him the my ring. ring. Yeah. Now and, I just want to serve. At the moment, the Russians are kind of fighting one of their brutal grinding wars against the Turks and the Balkans and the Black Sea area. Mm-hmm. And Louis Napoleon writes back, or Louis Bonaparte writes back to Louis Napoleon that while fighting Muslim barbarians is an honorable task, it's not honorable the way his son plans to do it. He writes, quote, To be sure, nothing is finer than military glory, to know that everyone is talking about you, to command armies, and to be in a position to change the destinies of people and nations. All of that, of course, is fine and attractive and cannot but excite a young gentleman's imagination. Unfortunately, one must also face a very real truth, one quite contrary to that noble view, and that is that all war, apart from that of legitimate self-defense of one home, one's home and nation, is in fact nothing but the act of a barbarian, which is only distinguished from that of savages and wild beasts by more satisfactory lies regarding its alleged necessity. His father continues that he should never forget, quote, one must only go to war and fight for his own country and for no others. Anyone who acts otherwise is just a mercenary, acting on contrived motives, or else is simply bloody-minded. Yeah. Which is... <laughs> like the most reasonable thing anyone's yeah. ever going to say to this kid. Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. It's like, like uh, and uh, bro, you of all the like countries to join, <laughs> you're going to join Russia to fight in the Balkans. It just seems yeah. like, yeah, bra. That you know ain't what they it. do to soldiers in Russia? They're, yeah. they're they're not even people. They just end up going. Like, do you know what they do in the Balkans? You, like, you good know what they god. Do in the <laughs> Just like it's nothing but like, hey, just uh, throw people at the other people. They mm-hmm. literally are ammo. Put I, them I, in the catapult. I, do, I like that, and I find it interesting that because Louis Napoleon is like, he starts this being like, hey, man, I have been a famous general and the command of the most famous military leader in history. Mm-hmm. I know it's addictive. It's mm-hmm. incredible to feel that kind of power and to feel like you're the center of the world's attention, mm-hmm. but it's also evil. And at the end of the day, anyone who says that what we were doing, anyone who says that what anyone's doing in that is anything but like butchery right. is a, is a liar. Yeah. Um, that's, it's kind of cool that he not only recognizes that, but finds it so important to try to get this across to his son. Yeah. Um, yeah. And he does it, you know, in sort of a secure circuitous way where he's just like, no, don't you don't want to fight for some other country. Yeah. You know? Yeah. If you if you have to do barbarism, you gotta do it for, for France. I mean, come yeah. on, dog. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, um and Louis Napoleon, he listens for now. Uh he does not join the Russian army, but he's 
going to be too much of a Bonaparte to stay away from the action and the pages of history for very long. So while he's muttering about, uh, his uncle's successor on the French throne decides to set up a military adventure of his own. And this is, I think, Charles X is the French king at this point. He invades Algeria on the advice of his prime minister. Now, (laughs) look at a map of Algeria (laughs) in relation to France. This is, there's no reason for France. France is not threatened by Algeria, right? This is not a this is not like a France and Germany going to war because they're afraid one is gonna like. <laughs> this is pure colonial adventurism, right? right? Yeah. Um, it is Algeria at this point is an Ottoman province, and the Ottomans leave it be. Like it's part of the Ottoman Empire. They don't govern it in a meaningful way. There's like a city there that they control and some trade routes. But mostly it's just people living in Algeria who are like, we're part of a country? What do you mean? Like, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Why, why are you trying to uh, set up all these DMVs everywhere? Yeah, we, we're just yeah. living our lives. <laughs> so the French people um, are, yeah, th- 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 this is a complicated thing in France, right? Because there's still a lot of desire to be an imperial power, like all these other countries they see around them. But also, this seems like an expensive and dangerous gamble. Um, And they're also, the French people are kind of pissed at Charles X because he is kind of a revanchist, right? He's on the side of the divine right of king's folks. One of the first things he does is he reduces the size of the eligible French electorate, the number of French people who get to vote uh, Mm -hmm. for parliament, from 5 million men to just 25,000. So he effectively turns it into only the the very wealthiest people have any kind of a vote. And he's hoping, the re, part of why he invades Algeria is he's hoping it's going to distract from this. But the right. war does not, does not go well. It turns into, I mean, we all know this, right? It's like an Afghanistan kind of situation. Mm-hmm. Um, it's, it, it's the kind of thing that like U.S. citizens and Russian citizens now are very familiar with, right? <laughs> he invades a country yeah. and realizes this is going to be a continuing problem. Um, yeah, they take and, and this is a, yeah. They literally stay there till the sixties. Is the fucking craziest yeah, they are, thing. They are they are there more than a hundred years. Yeah, <laughs> it yeah. Is, <laughs> and they never have a great handle on the country. No, it never goes well. But they're just like um, I don't know, dude. One of them kings, fucking, you know. Yeah. Did it like in order to win an election or something? Anyway, it's very show important you, that we be here. To show you how bad this shit goes for Charles the Tenth, he declares victory, I think, when his troops take Algiers on like July fifth. And on August the second, he abdicates and flees the country ahead of an angry mob. So <laughs> Not a great time. Again, if you're if you if you're like watching videos ever of like people rioting in Paris and like mm-hmm. beating the shit out of cops and being like, how did France get so good at rioting? Oh, they've been doing they, it. Dude. They have they have been doing it. They've been they have, doing it. They have kicked a lot of governments out of the country. That is their thing. Like they got like just they they have years and years mm-hmm. of barricade building experience. Yeah. Centuries of institutional knowledge of how to yeah. fuck up troops in the city. <laughs> It rules. Um, Although I think it was Louis uh, Napoleon, M- the Napoleon the Third, who f- kind of fucked it up. He does. For, he does for That's the rest of France. This is part of the story. Yeah. Yeah. So things being what they were, France gets a new king. This one is a member of the Orleans family. Uh, Orleans. Orleans, which means they are rel- related to King uh, uh, Leopold, Leopold the second, and oh, Leopold the first. Fr- Both. How? I look. It, there's a lot of fat, a lot of names. I got to keep track of right now. I had now. to remember. I was like Belgium, Belgium, and I was like, oh yeah, yeah, African Congo and shit. Yeah, Leopold. I think you were just sucked. assuming he was named Louis or. Uh, he is. Or, he yeah. is. He's King Louis Philippe. Yeah. The, the the king who takes over France is Louis Philippe. Yeah. Yeah. Um, He's related to King. Leopold. So Leopold. Yeah. I need so, some more original names, people. He does not end the occupation of Algeria. Uh, yeah. The well to do assholes who'd urged the invasion insisted that the only thing France could not do was retreat. Everyone else kind of assumed that eventually shit would get worked out, but a hundred years later, France is still fighting in Algeria, which <laughs> goes to show you how wise that logic usually is. Yeah. The occupation would cost hundreds of thousands of people their lives and nearly destroy France as a political entity. They 
basically have a revolution over this at one point. Yeah. Um, after, like, Louis Napoleon obviously does not know any of that's going to happen. It's well in the future. And he is focused on northern Italy. So northern Italy, when Napoleon Bonaparte is running around, gets liberated from Austrian domination. Uh, but it gets returned to Austrian domination by the Allies after Bonaparte loses. And a lot of Italians are not happy with this. They, there's a, a dream of making Italy be its own kind of independent political entity, which it had not been for quite a long time. Right. Um, so some of these guys form an insurgent army in northern Italy called the Carbonari. And yeah. Louis Napoleon and his older brother, Napoleon Louis, uh, both moved to Rome. I God, I hate the names. They I'm sorry. They suck so much. They probably got confused <sighs> themselves. Like, yeah, which so, one am I? Am I yeah. Tia or Tamara? Louis Napoleon is is our guy. His older brother is Napoleon Louis. They both moved to Rome and become active in the Carbonari cause. Their cell gets found out and busted. They're not great at being stealthy, right? They yeah. are they are the heirs to Napoleon Bonaparte. It's hard for them to just kind of move around and not attract attention. <laughs> Again, everyone kind of keeps an eye on what Bonapartes are doing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They're like, you know, um, uh, you're wearing a full on like it's fucking like, Napoleonic military garb yeah. right now. This is supposed like to be a, a secret sect. It's like if a Hitler moved into your neighborhood, right? Like, obviously, a Hitler today, there's nothing, they're not responsible for anything, but right. you would keep an eye on yeah, them. Yeah, you know who your <laughs> local Hitlers yeah. are. Yeah, no, you keep an eye on your local Hitlers. I'm not, yeah. not going to not pay attention to what the Hitlers are doing I mean, in, just my, so in the, my neighborhood. just, you know, peripheral view, just mm-hmm. look through the side of my eye, make sure they're not doing anything weird. That's all. Yeah, yeah, just just keep a goddamn eye on them. Mm-hmm. Um, so, anyway... Uh, the cell gets found out, busted, and the Napoleon's a- bro- the Napoleon the brothers Napoleon and their friends were forced out of Italy, barely ahead of the Austrian secret police, because nobody trusts the Bonapartes. The entirety of his family, because a lot of his families moved to Italy at this point, mm-hmm. including his mother and his uncle Jerome. They all have to flee as well because the 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 Napoleon boys get caught <laughs> fucking <laughs> trying to overthrow the Austrian government. Fucked up kids. <laughs> um, love it. So none of them are thrilled with this because they're all. Old, they they mm-hmm. don't want to deal with this shit. They don't want to overthrow the, the the Austrian regime in Italy. Um, their lives get upended, uh, and Louis and his brother Napoleon Louis, Louis Napoleon and Napoleon Louis, join larger groups of Carbonari who are like trying to execute a march on Rome. Basically, when this purge happens, a bunch of them arm up and they try to like do. They're kind of before Mussolini, trying to do the march on Rome kind yeah. of thing. And Louis Napoleon sends a letter back to his father saying, quote, the, the enthusiasm one finds here is simply grand. The army of pa- this army of patriots is now marching on Rome. Now, obviously, Louis Bonaparte does not approve of this. Again, he's like, don't fight anything but a defensive war and don't right. leave your country to fight for somewhere else. That's his opinion. Um, he condemns the measure. And he is absolutely right. This is a terrible idea. So... <laughs> The Carbonari, it doesn't, things do not go well for them. And after all the fucking shit is done, Louis Napoleon and his brother Napoleon Louis wind up in a city called Forli, kind of hiding out there, while it has a horrific measles epidemic, probably brought on in part by all of the people moving around and, you know, revolutionaries and shit. So his older brother gets sick on March 11th, 1831, and is dead on by March 17th, 1831. Damn. Which, he yeah, dies of measles? Yeah. He dies of measles after trying to free Italy from Austrian domination. Oh, fuck. <laughs> this now makes Louis Napoleon technically the heir to Napoleon Bonaparte, emperor. Oh, now, shit. This is obviously very sad for the whole Bonaparte family. Um, Louis's first grand attempt at being a hero has, got, has gotten his older brother killed, but it also leads him to return to French territory for the first time in his adult life because he and his mother have to flee the shit out of Italy. And despite the fact that King Louis Philippe has banned all Bonapartes from France, he allows Louis Napoleon and his mother to stay, basically just kind of out of sympathy, like, well, your brother's dead, like, you guys got kicked out of... And, like, Louis Philippe is kind of sympathetic to the Italian national cause, as most French people are, right? Because right. the Austrians are their big enemies. So he's like, you guys can crash. Just keep quiet. Don't tell yeah. anybody that you're here, and Don't I'm not going to make trouble Don't try to overthrow me or you. some shit. Just, like, chill, yeah. all right? And, and briefly, Louis Napoleon is, like, overwhelmed with gratitude for this, and so he asks for permission to join the French military, and the <laughs> king is like, yeah, you can join the French military, but... We kind of have an issue with Bonaparte's being in the French military. So 
you can do it as long as you don't use your real name. And he agrees uh-huh. to like make him account of something under a different name. Mm-hmm. But Louis Napoleon takes this as an insult. And he tells the king, quote, I should prefer to be laid out with my brother in his coffin first. <laughs> and he proceeds to like insult the king enough that he has to flee the country. Uh, <laughs> Such a bitch. <laughs> Such a little, ah. He just like, it, no matter where he goes, he's like, I will flee. I don't give a fuck. Mm. I'll say whatever I'll I need to I don't say. Give a sh- I don't give a shit, bro. I don't, I don't give, give a shit. shit. I got so many castles to crash in. So he winds up in fucking London. Um, (laughs) And for the next few years, Lewis bounces around London and Switzerland. He publishes a couple of books, one on the use of artillery and another on the history of his father's rule in France and his uncle's rule in Holland. Mm -hmm. Uh, Or his father's rule in Holland and his uncle's rule in France. Yeah. Um, He sends his dad, Lewis Bonaparte, copies of this book about, like, Lewis and Napoleon Bonaparte. And his dad is furious about this, writing, quote, Ought the political policies of the head of your family, of a man such as the emperor be superficially judged by a mere young man of 24 <laughs> Damn. Like, who are you to fucking write about what i did like fuck you kid you don't know shit you're too young uh yeah i love it it's basically it's very fiction. funny it is it's very funny um so Lewis is heartbroken, but the Swiss army promotes him to captain over his books about artillery. So maybe his dad was being a dick here, or maybe the Swiss army doesn't know anything about artillery. Yeah. You know who does know a lot about artillery? Oh, is it the um, Lake Superior? <laughs> it's about to. It's fucking about <laughs> to, Matt. Hell yeah. Let's blow it up. We're back. And Mm. we're talking about the Davy Crockett, which was a handheld nuclear rocket that a guy could just shoot at a thing. And it'll it'll kill you, right? You shoot shoot a Davy Crockett, you're probably not making it. I think the plan was for them to rear up in a motorcycle, (laughs) fire it, and then fucking book it back. (laughs) As fast as possible. It had to be a really fast motorcycle. What a funny thing. Like, a fu- like when people are just like, they're just spitballing how nuclear war is going to work. What yeah. do we do to have guys in motorcycles and nuking folks? Like, yeah, let's like give it a, a shot. Nukes, but <laughs> little bitty Crockett. ones. We'll put a little Fuck raccoon it. hat on top of it. <laughs> It'll be it sweet. Is, it is so goddamn funny. Anyway, <laughs> we should do that to, I don't know, what, what's the smallest of the Great Lakes, Sophie? You're the expert. Erie. That's my know. guess. Erie, the... Erie. F- yeah, well, that's how we'll that's how we'll drop Lake Erie. Why yeah. am I the expert like... on the Great Lakes? Because you're near. You've lived in Michigan. I've never lived yeah, in you've Michigan. Spent... I have family do I from time that, around then? there. Why do I think Mich- that? Because I have family from Michigan. Okay. Yeah. That's the same. Yeah. Exactly. And it's and it's you... not Lake Erie because it's Lake which on- one? It's anyway. Lake Ontario. There's an Ontario lake. Lake Ontario is the smallest. There's too many of them. 7,340 square miles. Do you know that off the top of your head or did you just do a quick You'll Google? never fucking know, Matt. Because <laughs> that was yep. incredible. Wow. Yep, yep, yep. Why, why I'm going uh, to assume you knew it off the top of your head. Yeah, I'm, I'm that good. I'm that good. Isn't that right, Snoop from The Wire? Yeah. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> she says, Europe. Uh, she might God. have said Europe. Anyways, back to the war in yeah. Europe. Europe. Yeah. Anyway, um, yeah, back to the war in Europe. So uh, things are, you know, rough for Louis Napoleon. Um, his dad has 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 just rejected him. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and in fact, Again. when his dad when his dad writes back that he doesn't like his kid's book, uh, Louis Napoleon stops responding. Or to his father's letters for six months. Um, yeah. He finally does reply to one in 1835 that says, Mon cher papa, I receive your harsh words so very often that I should be quite used to them by now. Regardless, every new reproach by you does indeed wound me, and as painfully <laughs> as on the very first occasion. <laughs> And again, oh, it's, maybe I his dad's that. a dick for not praising the book or whatever. He probably should have encouraged that. But most of what his dad's saying is like, don't just join the army to go fucking fight in a war. It's bad. Like that's yeah. like don't 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 do just do don't just like fuck around with other people's lives and guns because it looks cool. It's it's yeah, it's like I think fucked his up dad, of you. 
like could tell that his son was like the biggest poser. Yeah, yeah, we're gonna have a problem with this kid. Yeah, I, this I, kid I should, is a fucking yeah. poser, but for, like, uh, uh, just all of our worst instincts, he thinks are yeah. cool. And we've got he's got the Bonaparte blood, and boy, we we can be problems. I know it. I can admit that now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We we have some issues, and yeah. uh, we really don't want this guy being encouraged. No. Let's just say that much. So, in the summer of that year, Louis Napoleon meets a man who would set his life on a purposeful track. And this guy's name is Jean Gilbert Victor Fialin, um, mm. better known as Gilbert Persigny. Can I just say uh, brave, new name? Thank I you. know. I know. Gilbert Pretty Persigny. Sick. Anyway, he's the son of a tax collector and a former NCO in the French army who had been forced out of the army because he was a Republican, right? Uh, he'd taken to work as a journalist where he had become kind of a, a propagandist for the Bonapartist cause. Mm -hmm. He befriends Louis largely because he's really good at, at kissing Louis's ass and shutting up when his social betters start talking. He basically only speaks up to tell Louis how cool the Bonapartes are and how they definitely should become the emperors of france again oh i love and, it he's like the turtle from entourage of like the bone yeah Pops. and he but he also he kind of convinces louis Na louis napoleon that like the king of france is misruling the country and the french people are hungry for a mm. bonaparte to take power again and he's not wrong and he is not gonna be wrong so <laughs> we will be talking about everything that happens after that in part do. That's yeah. the French, right? That's how the that's, French say That's two. French for two. What that's a bunch right. of assholes. What a bunch yeah. of assholes. Meanwhile, um, the word two means you. It's like, come on, yeah, guys. It's nonsense. Nonsense language. It just makes no sense. Isn't that right, Bunk? Yeah, ba da ba da ba do. That's Bunk. <laughs> <laughs> that's what French sounds like. Uh, oh, boy. God. You love to see Somebody it. Somebody fucked up when they gave you that power, Matt. <laughs> they did, and they <laughs> fucked up hardcore. <laughs> no, that's actually what Kanye was talking about when he said n no one man should have all that power. <laughs> yes, he was talking about uh, <laughs> Jewish people. And <laughs> 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 oh, shit. I just love that. He is just uh, like, he went full anti-Semite and I'm like, oh boy. Uh, yeah. You know, I, I yeah. got to have him on the soundboard. Mm -hmm. God, it's what like, a time it's been for, for Kanye, for Elon. Oh, I for know. For Donald Trump, quite a month or two. Yeah, it's been an interesting time for neo-fascists all around. Um, yeah, it's yeah. going to be interesting to see where this all goes. Yep. <laughs> Speaking of where this all goes, you should go watch The Wire. <laughs> and then, You should go watch The Wire. And then Check listen, it out. Yeah. Listen to my podcast, Pod Yourself The Wire, the greatest, the wire pod, the only The Wire podcast ever. And um, I just had a baby, and all I want is for you to give us five stars in a review and listen yeah. to it. Listen, you five. if you thought Prince Charles in the latest mm -hmm. season of The Crown was too hot, yes. watch The Wire and give Matt five stars. That's right. He's even more hot in The Wire, and he plays a Baltimore Irishman with a weird accent. Very weird yeah. accent. Yeah. Yeah. He should have just gone with, oh, it's me, McNulty. Isn't he? Yeah. He's he's motherfucking playing Prince Charles in some yes, show. Yes, isn't he? Is. Yeah, yeah, no. thank, thank you for joining the chat. We've had this conversation <laughs> twice on this episode. Yes. We've also had this <laughs> chat in the oh, in forgot. the Cool Zone it, Media group text when I sent multiple articles being like, this is not right. He looks McNulty. great. Yes, you know? McNulty. Prince McNulty, I'm for it. I'm for it. At first I was uh, against it because he's too hot. And then I watched and I was like, yeah, I like it. I can I can handle it. I can hang. Mm -hmm. I do I do yep. like that they they make sure to let you know that Prince Charles is much shorter than Diana. There's like yeah, right? I, I, they were like, No, 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 we're not Hollywoodizing this no. <laughs> this height change. Yes, we gotta make him a little ass man. It, yeah. That's oh, what he man. is. Yeah, mm -hmm. Robert, what anything did you I do? Robert, any, <laughs> anything you want to plug at the end here? <laughs> All right, everybody. Uh, we are doing a Behind the Bastards live stream virtual wow, event. Wow, brave. With Robert, Courageous. myself, Heroic. and the one and only Erotic. Margaret Killjoy. Oh, uh, yeah. This will be happening December 8th. You can get your tickets at momenthouse.co slash BTB, and we will link... And all the appropriate places. 
it'll be a hoot. We're going to do an episode. We're going to do a Q&A. Uh, anything you'd like to add, Robert? Uh, never. No. Uh, also, <laughs> buy my book, After the Revolution, wherever the fuck you find books. Yeah. Or on the AK Press website. But, you know, it's on everything. It's on all the book buying sites. Great. We'll be back. We sure will, Sophistopolis.